Okay, we're starting Biology of Fishes here on the 6th of September, uh, 2012. I'm William Neal, just as it says here on Howdy. Howdy recognizes me. Uh, that's good, but Howdy can't figure out that you folks who are in the non-live sections of WFSC 616 are actually in the course. Uh, I think uh, you all should have gotten, those of you who are registrants in the course, should have gotten an email from me last night explaining the problem we're having with the records. And uh, at this point, you know, this is the way, by the way, faculty uh, rosters look on how do you may not have seen one of these. You probably see the student version. But this shows that there should be uh, seven people actually in 417-500, and there are, and eight people, uh, which is three more than capacity in uh, 417-599, so they got the undergraduate uh, course right, both uh, local and distant, or local and web, but uh, only the 600 level of the graduate course shows up here. You know, it says there are five and five, there are five people, and that's the way it ought to be. And I don't know, you know, here are the numbers, but there are no names or nothing to view. There's no section designation, and I understand that you, uh, when you go into Howdy under your account as students, you can't see that you're registered in this course. But trust me, uh, we're going to fight together to make sure you are officially acknowledged at some point. I think Felix has been explaining to people who contact him that it's possible to go in and view details and see that you are, in fact, registered in the courses you're in. I guess this is a, pr a problem all over campus. I don't know. Any of you in the room here aware of this? Because local students haven't had a problem. Uh, it's, these, it's these people in sections uh, 699, uh, 700, and 720 in the graduate course that are having trouble. Maybe it'll get straightened out. I hope. So, uh, let me uh, take us home here to the archive page. And here's where we are, you know, we're on the 6th of September, and that record will be posted after the session today. Uh, the three slide per page handout on feeding I've already handed to the folks who are present here in the room with me. Um, we're going to finish up a consideration of environmental issues and then move on to feeding today. Uh, I don't know if I pointed you to this, but I need to at this point, and that is the expectations that Ashley and, and Donovan have for your lab reports. That sort of lays out what they want. Uh, you're going to be generating an abstract uh, for the report. That's the only formally written part of the report is a little half page or so abstract. This is not a writing course. This is a thinking course, I like to say. A calculating course. Um, there's this uh, help converting uh, 2003 to 2007 that uh, I guess may be superseded now by the new help files that I created using Excel 2010 because that's pretty similar to 2007. Come on in and grab a couple of handouts on your way, please. So, um, I guess the main thing I wanted to say is, you know, here's all the records from the lab session that we had on Tuesday locally. And uh, people who are distant are, I hope, in the process, if they haven't already done so, of playing back the, the proceedings, AVIs, which captured what we did here in the room. Downloading the raw data template, uh, downloading the black and white version of the PowerPoints, and, uh, and downloading the simulation model and actually conducting the, the virtual experiment that we did. And the other uh, thing I want to communicate is that all that you would need for Lab 1 to finish the job is already posted here. It's posted with the date of September the 11th because that would be the next formal lab time next Tuesday, but um, there's no reason for you to wait. Um, the way the help sessions, the every other session goes, 
is that Donovan and I, too, for the most part, will be around here. And people who are in the live labs or people even who are not are welcome to drop in during the lab period and work on the lab. But there won't be any formal uh, business transacted by way of uh, presentations. The presentation has already been done, and that's in the form of these help files. So the way this works is that you will carry out the, uh, the guidelines, or you will carry out the analysis that's given in the guidelines, and to help you in that process, there are the help files. And to get those to, those are like these, they're, uh, you know, captures of the screen and my voice. And so you'll need to be able to play back audio on your computer, wherever you are. And if you're here in the classroom, uh, we're going to have uh, a dozen people all playing back these files at different rates and at different points in the file at any time. So obviously we can't have speakers. We're going to have to. You're going to have to bring um, ear ear uh, plug type headphones or, or actual headphones if you want. So that's just a heads up on that. If you're going to work with us here in the local lab next Tuesday, you'll need to come prepared with uh, headphones or earphones. Um, so when you when you do this, depending on what your what version of Excel you're working with, you want to use the Excel 2003 help files or the Excel 2010 help files. They're intended to be uh, equivalent. But they're not, you know, because I learned a lot in the first help file production, and uh, I was a little smoother and and didn't make as many mistakes that I had to go back and correct when I did the new 2010 files. And when I say 2010, I'm talking about Excel 2010. I actually did them this past summer. So there's where we are, and this this. Uh, Archive will just keep growing as we go along during the semester. But you're always welcome if you want to jump ahead and anticipate something to go down into the last time we did this and look for the equivalent record. And I will say, I'm doing this every time. In other words, before I come in the classroom or the lab, I'll play back the old one and hear what I said. And uh, I'll try to repeat it pretty much for the most part, because we're doing the same thing this time we did in 2011. But, you know, sometimes I did it better in 2011 than I'm doing it now. And so, you know, if you if you run into something that's not making sense in the 2012 presentation that you're getting, you might want to go back to the archive for 2011 and, and hear what I said about it there. Sometimes it's better. And it's hard to, you know, it's hard for me to tell you exactly where and when, but... And yeah, it's all there, so you can see where we're going, both in lecture and lab. Okay, so let's talk about where we are right now. I'm going to get out of, off the web altogether and take you to uh, environment again and to the point where we stopped. And I'll uh, go into the presentation mode, do my control A to keep my arrow visible, and just sort of pace over here to the point where we stopped, and I actually want to pause on my way. Um, here. And, um, and, and point out something, a transaction that's occurred, and I want to share it with you. You know, I guess I may have made the case uh, generally. I know I made it to uh, subsets of you that what I'm trying to do is is create a spirit of community, an intellectual community. And one thing we really want to do, if we can, is take advantage of the participation of some of the professionals that aren't in the course as as registered students, like Ray, and like our colleagues in Texas Parks and Wildlife. Uh, you know, the benefit that they get is that they get uh, to see uh, the way that I do this course. Uh, particularly, they're interested for the most part in ecofish. And the benefit you and I get is that we get the benefit of their participation and their experience. 
uh, and you know, hopefully, you'll actually establish connections with some of these folks, you know, and they become your professional contacts. And one of those guys sent me an email last night, Paul Kaysen. Paul is uh, in charge of the fish production operation at uh, Palacios with the Texas Parks and Wildlife. He, he manages the, the pond part of that program. And what Paul said was that when he played this file back and he saw this presentation, this graph here, that, hey, you know, I kept... Uh, pointing out that that was mighty late in the day for a low point, I thought. And he said, you know, maybe what's going on here is these are intense production ponds. And in order to keep the DO up when you've got a really high biomass of fish being produced in the pond, uh, you have to run aerators, paddle wheel aerators. And so, you know, maybe what's going on here is that the paddle wheel aerators uh, ran until... Uh, I kept the DO high, artificially, so to speak, until early morning, uh, a little after daylight, and then they turn off the aerators. And DO then falls a little bit because the demand is still there. Photosynthesis hasn't kicked in. Uh, so I don't know. You know, that's a, that's a good hypothesis, I think, Paul. And as I indicated to Paul, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to bring out of my toolkit, a model that I've been working on to explore that hypothesis. It's a dynamic DO model, a dynamic water quality model. If it was a high intensity pond, wouldn't, it, wouldn't the aerator be on 24 7? Uh, so the question is if it's a high intensity pond, wouldn't the aerator be on 24 7? No, probably not. I mean, they're, all they're trying to do is, is prevent any disastrous low DOs. Um, and typically once the sun comes up and maybe the wind starts blowing again, uh, you know, it's, it's a matter of monitoring. And if you, uh, I think they have a set of rules, and maybe Paul could tell us what they are, you know, uh, guidelines. If DO is below a certain point, then turn on the aerators, you know, that kind of thing, and then turn them off again when DO rises. So we can, we can probably find that out. Anyhow, I thought that was an interesting a suggestion and uh, one I intend to follow up on. Let me get rid of my gum here. Uh, and we appreciate it, Paul. So uh, let's pace on over here to. Uh, I guess one other thing I would like to say here that that figures into this. That in fact, what I'm planning sort of is in my grand finale presentation in Lab 6, not just talking about the nuts and bolts of EcoFish, but talking about some extensions of EcoFish to what I call EcoPond, where EcoFish is a player in the whole system, and lots of EcoFish affect the system in a feedback way. And they produce a lot of carbon dioxide. They use a lot of oxygen. There's also other players in the system. You know, there's lots of phytoplankton. It's a pretty rich system. And the thing, that, the thing I'm thinking is that there's a real difference between the dynamics of CO2 and pH in these real-world systems with lots of critters and the sterile systems that we tend to think about and the one that that little model that I've shown you here is based on. And it looks to me like what's going on is that CO2, which is a waste for you and me, is a valuable resource to phytoplankton. And when they produce CO2 in respiration at night, my uh, assessment is, based on the modeling I've done and based on the literature now that I get into it a little bit, is that they're not going to squander a, a valuable resource by excreting it like we do into the medium. Rather, what they're going to do is keep it close to their little... Uh, I'm trying to think of the name of those little organelles in phytoplankton. Chloroplasts. You know, so it, it's handy the next day when they need it in photosynthesis. And what that means is that you really can't count on the one-to-one -one respiratory quotient idea, you know, between oxygen use and CO2 production to, uh, to anticipate the dissolved uh, concentration of CO2 and bicarbonate and everything else. In other words, the excreted uh, CO2 is, is less than what you would think. 
based on the amount of biomass of fish and all that. So I'm, I'm giving you a little preface, a little preview of what I'm, of the case I'm going to hope to have a little better grip on by the end of this course. Something that Robert Vega and I have been working on for a while. It looks like phytoplankton are sequestering CO2 at night and not turning it loose in the water. And the consequence is that you don't get the tremendous drop, even given the alkalinity of the system, that you would expect in pH. Why? Because CO2 is not being, uh, you know, not a player. It's not being released. It's bound. Still inside the, the biomass of, of phytoplankton. Okay, well, that probably needed to be added at this point. That's the newest thinking that I've been doing. It brings us to uh, temperature and heat. That's where I wanted to start today because that's sort of a fairly complicated and important uh, set of relationships here. And the first thing to say is the obvious thing, and that is that water is really special in lots of ways. And one of the ways it's special is that in terms of its thermal properties, um, the specific heat of water is one I guess that's really a, an incorrect statement there. Um, the heat capacity of water, the heat capacity is one calorie per gram degree, uh, meaning that if you have uh, one gram of pure water and you put one calorie of heat into it uh, under ideal conditions, the temperature goes up one degree centigrade. In fact, that's the definition of a calorie. And uh, you can measure heat capacities in different ways. You know, you can measure it in terms of Fahrenheit degrees and in terms of pounds and get things like BTUs, you know, and and all these have different dimensions. But when the dimensions are calories per gram degree, then you take away the dimensions and you get a dimensionless quantity that's called specific heat. So that's the difference between specific heat. So really what, I, what I'm talking about here is heat capacity, not specific heat. Specific heat is one if heat capacity is one calorie per gram degree. Relative to the medium that uh, is ours as air-breathing terrestrial animals, air, uh, the heat capacity of water is way more uh, on a mass basis, uh, uh, rather on a volume basis, uh, it's 4.2 times dry air. But if you put it on an equal uh, mass basis, let me get this straight. On a volume to volume, okay, that's what I was, I'm looking ahead in my notes and I'm not thinking as clearly as I should. On a mass basis, which is the way it's calculated, it's 4.2. But on a volume basis, it's 3,200 times. Uh, and that's because the density of air is so much lower than water and occupies so much more volume per unit mass. And I did a little calculation to bring this point home. And it is this, that the heat capacity of a 10-gallon ten, ten aquarium, uh, the water in a 10-gallon aquarium, is about the same as the heat capacity of a room full of air uh, that's 20 by 25 feet by 9 feet. That's not too far from what the room is that we're in presently here in College Station. So on a, on a, on a mass basis, the heat capacity of water is 4.2 times that of dry air on a volume basis. Uh, it's 3,200 times that of air. And what this does ecologically from our fish perspective is that it makes thermal, it makes the aquatic habitat relative, relatively a very stable place thermally compared to the air above that aquatic habitat. So there can be these dramatic swings in temperature in the air, uh, day to night, for example. Uh, that are damped out in the water and don't uh, make for much of a swing in the temperature of the water. So a 20 degree amplitude of diel variation in the air may, re may be reduced only a degree or so in a, even in a shallow pond or two degrees. So specific heat of water is really exceptionally high compared to dry air. It's actually uh, Pretty exceptionally high period, you know, because uh, I think only two uh, conventional substances uh, 
like what? Like um, ammonia and uh, and hydrogen have higher specific heats. And ammonia is not that much higher. I think it's only about 1.5 or so. And and hydrogen, liquid hydrogen has has a specific heat around three or three point something. And that accounts for why those are you know important uh, in refrigeration technology. Um, latent heat diffusion and evaporation are also exceptional for uh, air. Uh, the latent heat of Fusion is the additional heat that has to be extracted from a unit mass of substance. Once it's at its freezing point in the liquid phase, in order to convert it into the solid phase, in the case of water, we're talking about going from water at zero degrees centigrade to ice at zero degrees centigrade. And that's uh, 80 calories per gram. And that is... Uh, High in uh, in an absolute sense, only only ammonia has a higher heat uh, of fusion than water. Again, why ammonia figured prominently in early refrigeration, but it's kind of a dangerous material to work with, so it doesn't anymore. And at the other end of the thermal, uh, well, at the other end of the of the liquid state thermally for water at 100 degrees centigrade. Um, we're talking even way more heat, uh, 540 calories per gram. So once you bring water uh, to the boiling point, uh, where it's going to go from the liquid phase to the gas phase, uh, turn from liquid water to water vapor or steam, you got to add another 540 calories per gram. And, and there's no substance known that has a higher latent heat of evaporation or boiling heat than, than water. So what does that mean to uh, aquatic organisms? It means that um, water um, resists a change of state. You know, it, the swing in the heat flux in and out of the aquatic habitat can be much more than it otherwise would be and still have liquid for the animal to swim around in. You know, fish don't swim too well in either ice or uh, steam, so it's good that it's liquid, right? So, um, you know, think about it this way. Um, let's start with some water, a gram of water at 50 degrees centigrade, midway between the freezing point and the, and the boiling point. And we take a gram, or we take a calorie out of that gram of water, and what happens to the temperature? Well, it goes down one degree because the Specific heat is one. The heat capacity is one calorie per gram degree. We take another calorie out. It goes down another degree. So we go from 50 to 49 to 48. And we keep doing that. And we take 50 calories out of that one gram of water. And we're at the freezing point. But we still got liquid water. Take another calorie out. What happens to state? Nothing. What happens to temperature? Nothing. Take another calorie out. We still got liquid water at zero degrees. You've got to take out 80 calories before you get ice at zero degrees. And then, if you take out another calorie, you get ice that's slightly less than zero degrees, and the ice keeps going down. Uh, in fact, though, uh, ice has only about half the heat capacity of liquid water, so because of its structure. And what that means is that now for every calorie you remove, you actually get two degrees drop in the temperature of the ice. So the ice keeps getting... You know, ice doesn't have to be at zero. It just it's, If you've got an ice-water mix, then you're pretty much guaranteed that the temperature of that mixture is zero degrees. But once it's solid ice, you know, it can keep on going. It can be 50 degrees below zero ice easily. Similarly, at the other end of the spectrum, then you keep adding that calorie, and finally you get to 100 C... Add another one, you still got 100 C. Add another one, you have to have 540 more before you finally get a change in state to the, to the water vapor or steam state. These things are affected by pressure, obviously. Boiling points are, the temperature of boiling are different, you know, at, at different elevations, being reduced as you go up. 
We're talking about under standard conditions here at sea level. Uh, thermal conductivity of water is also, relative to air, uh, pretty exceptional. It's 34 times greater uh, than dry air at uh, standard temperature conditions. It's not very exceptional compared to other materials. You know, uh, copper and, and metals in general have much higher thermal conductivity than water. But compared to air, it's got good thermal conductivity. And the significance of that is that it makes it hard for water-breathing uh, animals like fish uh, that live submerged in the water and breathe the water to be anything other than poikilotherms because the flux of heat, every time they produce a little heat through their metabolism, that, that heat is, is conducted or convected and then conducted away into the water and vice versa. So fish are going to be pretty much... Uh, they're going to have a hard time being any temperature other than the temperature of the water they're living in. So what about whales and seals? Well, they're not breathing the water, right? They're immersed in it. But they may have some pretty good insulation. Uh, blubber, for example, to uh, reduce heat flux. And then the air doesn't have much heat capacity and the conductivity of air is low so they can breathe the air and not hurt themselves too much in terms of uh, the heat flux effects on, on temperature. Uh, doesn't do fish much good to have a layer of fat, you know, to insulate their core from water because they're breathing the water. They have their gills and in their blood is in intimate contact with the water. So they got really not much choice except to do some funny things with their circulatory system that tunas do. We'll talk about that. So high specific heat makes aquatic habitats thermally stable, temporarily. Uh, high, very high latent heat of fusion, evaporation, tends to make water stay in the liquid state over a big range of heat fluxes. And then high thermal conductivity of the water means that heat comes and goes very uh, relatively easily between the animal and the surrounding environment, so it's hard for fish to be or to be anything except for kill terms. Uh, there's an interesting effect of uh, temperature on water's density. Uh, and that is that if you're talking fresh water, and I emphasize the fresh part, uh, water tends to increase in density as it cools, okay, like any other substance, any decent substance would do that, right? But once the temperature hits 4 degrees, the density starts to decrease again. So water reaches its maximum density uh, well above the freezing point, fresh water, of 4 degrees. And it doesn't freeze until it gets down to zero. And the significance of that is that in freshwater systems, um, water tends to freeze from the top down, which is where the flux of heat goes. I mean, the flux is going between the mass of water and the atmosphere, not between the mass of water and the earth so much. So water tends to freeze at its surface instead of freezing from the bottom up the way it would if it were a normal liquid under these conditions. Because the coldest water is the water that's up at the surface, and that's the water that's exchanging the heat with the atmosphere, and that's the water that's going to freeze first when the temperature of the atmosphere finally goes to the freezing point or below. Um, probably a good place to interject the fact that, you know, and I don't have a slide on this, uh, you know, I told you already that salinity also has an effect on the density of water. In fact, you know, the more salt you got, the more dense the water, and you can even uh, specify this rule of thumb, uh, 0 0.001 increase in density per part per thousand. Um, so it might occur to you, well, if, if, if temperature also affects density, what's the, what's the trade-off? It, would it be possible to have water, uh, two volumes of water at you know, two different salinity levels and two different temperatures and have them be equally dense, even though they have difference. 
You know, I talked to you about the plunging thermal plume, and that's one of the consequences of this. And I should have said it at the time. It turns out that at 20 degrees centigrade, 5 degrees temperature is equal to 1 part per thousand in terms of its effect on density. So that's a rule of thumb that you can store away. 5 degrees centigrade equals 1 part per thousand in terms of salinity effects, I mean density effects. Is that making sense? Let's see if I can make it make sense in terms of an... I said, what kind of water could you mix? Okay. What I think I'm saying is that if you had water at 20 degrees, if you had water at 10 parts per thousand at 20 degrees, I think that water would be have the same density as water uh, at 10 degrees that 8 parts per thousand. 5 degrees per part per thousand effect on density. So I think that's right. So it only takes two parts per thousand difference in salinity in order to offset a 10 degree delta T on a discharge of thermal effluent. So it's not too surprising. It would be easy to generate a situation where you get a plunging plume. All you have to have is just a little more salt in the water that's being taken into the condensers than the receiving water. point to be made, too, is that... Uh, once the freezing point is reached and once you start to develop uh, ice at the surface, um, and especially once that ice accumulates a layer, of, a layer of snow on top of it, that acts as insulation and it prevents the convective mixing that would occur due to the wind blowing across the surface of the water. And uh, it also insulates from uh, conduction because snow particularly with a lot of air, and it's not a real good conductor if it's fluffy snow particularly. And so what that means is that once you get the ice on the water and a snow layer on top of the ice, then that greatly limits heat transfer. And that has the effect of preventing even a shallow body of water from freezing all the way to the bottom in the winter, which it would otherwise do. I mean, you can go to the Arctic tundra and you can find water that's a couple of meters deep in you know, these tundra ponds and go down with a, an auger and discover that the bottom half meter or so, at least, is still liquid. And that's a good thing because fish don't like to try to swim, you know, in ice. Or, uh, so our Arctic blackfish are glad that that's the case, Ray, that there's still liquid down there, even in the coldest winter. A little bit of liquid. Another... Uh, thing that I ought to say here that I think comes as a surprise to a lot of people is that, um, you know, this four degree uh, maximum density point is only true for fresh water for zero part per thousand uh, total dissolved solids. When you start adding salt to water, that affects the temperature at which it reaches its maximum density. And so here's another little a piece of information that will give you the competitive edge on your peers that didn't know this, and that is that the point of equivalency, the point where the temperature at maximum density is the same as the freezing temperature, which happens to be minus 1.3 degrees, by the way. That's not the important thing. The important thing is it's 25 parts per thousand salt. So it's not full sink seawater. Full uh, strength seawater is not going to tend not going to tend to freeze from the top because the densest, coldest water is going to be the water at the bottom. And in fact, an ocean situation where it's really cold, like in the Beaufort, and it starts to freeze, you know, it's a funny kind of thing. It's not like freezing in fresh water where you get this film of ice forming at the surface, you know. As long as, you know, once the wind lays a little bit, you get the ice forming, and then it really grows thick, and, and that prevents any additional breakup, you know. In the case of uh, seawater, what happens, you get this sort of slushy stuff that's kind of forming throughout the water column. Now, ice, though, has a density that's only about 0.9 water. Uh, and sea ice is less saline than seawater. And so what this means is that when the Beaufort is freezing at Dead Horse in Alaska, you get this sort of uh, slurp, uh, slurp, uh, slurpy-type consistency. 
and the, the blobs the, of, of slurpy-like ice kind of start floating to the surface, and then they form a layer of slurpy on the surface, and then it, you finally get a calm night and not much wind action, and then it freezes harder than a brick. Um, there's one other kind of freezing that can occur in that. Um, Supercooled objects like a, a Jeep uh, that's exposed to 40 below zero air sitting out on the deck and there's some mistake in the in hoisting that thing off onto the drill pad and it's dropped in the water instead. And what happens is instantly it's it's encased by a layer of very clear ice. It just forms a solid uh, anchor of ice around it. So that's a different kind of freezing, you know, that's super cool water crystallizing instantly at maybe minus 40 or so. Well, these are these are little stories and they're interesting little exceptions or uh, dimensions away from the central theme here. The central theme is the, the general situation with water, particularly for folks that are mostly interested in fresh water. In fresh water like this, though, you know, here's the story, and this you've seen before in Dr. Welke's course or someplace. You're probably tired of seeing it, but you need to see it one more time to be sure you've seen it. And what I got here is a is a, a lenthic freshwater system. That would be the, the limnologist word for a standing body of water, like a lake or a reservoir, as opposed to a flowing system like a stream or a river or a brook, that'd be a lodic system. This is a lentic system. And so we got a we got a lake here and uh this could be a lake um in uh Wisconsin uh maybe. And uh it's it's uh up and down and it's uh now and then. So there's time on the X and there's depth on the Y and the y-axis is reversed from the normal. You know, usually you think of y-axis is increasing going from the lower left up. But with lakes, we usually turn the scale around because we used to think it in terms of depth. And so we got zero at the top and we got 50 meters down here at the bottom or 100 meters or something, right? So we got a reverse axis on, on y. So we keep the, the normal relationship of up and down consistent with the numbers. And so, let's start out over here in the summer. At these high latitudes, you know, you might have 30 degrees, and maybe not, uh, in the surface water. And depending on how, you know, much depth and how much wind and how much fetch and all these issues, you would have a meter or maybe just centimeters, maybe a five or six meters of epilimnion or upper mixed layer where there's a relative relatively uh, slow rate of decrease in temperature as you go downward from the surface. The warmest water is at the surface. Why? Because at 30 degrees and anywhere in that neighborhood, you got lower density at 30 and you're going to have it at a lower temperature. So the warmer water is going to be the, the water that gets the solar installation, gets the heat injection. Uh, and it's also going to be the lightest water, so it's going to be floating on the other. But the wind is causing some mixing, and that mixing will extend down for a greater or lesser depth. Uh, eventually, though, uh, the mixing of the wind will start to lose its impact on circulation, convective transfer of heat up and down in the water column, and you'll end up with a rapid decrease in temperature and other variables. Uh, we call that a thermocline. And I guess the classic definition of a thermocline is if the change is greater than uh, one degree per meter. You know, but I don't know if that's a rule that anybody pays any attention to anymore. I mean, you can get into a really shallow situation, especially one with some rooted aquatics that are preventing a lot of, and you can feel that difference, you know, uh, in a, you know, you can feel a much greater uh, steepness than that. So, one degree per meter. Um, down below that um, region of, of Rapid decrease, there is a lower layer that we call the hypolimnion, where 
there's some circulation that's probably longer term, much greater period going on. And stuff moves around, but it moves around pretty slowly. And there's not a lot of exchange between that hypolimnion or that lower mixed layer and the upper mixed layer. There may be an accumulation of nutrients in the hypolimnion. There may be a loss of oxygen because of all those nutrients. So you may have oxygen deficient, nutrient rich deep water and a lack of light down there. This is usually below the euphotic zone, the true light zone. Uh, means that there's not a lot of photosynthetic production of oxygen going on. Not much activity of plants that would make use of the nutrients. So it accumulates until you get an upwelling situation and then you get a bloom. Okay, we'll get to that. Uh, so, but then the summer wanes and, and we go into uh, late summer about this time of year and the temperature finally starts to fall. Boy, I hope it falls here eventually. You know, we've got 100 degrees every day lately. College station. Temperature drops at the surface and downward mixing causes a drop in lower, um, at lower depths. And finally, um, you know, we're getting on down now in the late fall and the temperature's down to 8 degrees at the surface, um, down to six or 5 or 6 degrees at the bottom. Uh, 8 degrees is still uh, less dense than 5 or 6. And so still we get the floating. But... There's, an incre- there's a breakdown in the stratification. And so there's less difference now between the surface temperature and the bottom temperature. And uh, fish know that. You know, fish start to move throughout all these depths because with this increase in mixing at the bottom, there is oxygen being transported downward. And so it's no longer the, no longer the hypoxic situation it was in the early summer. Well, you know, finally, uh, the temperature of the air is cooled off to the point where the temperature of the air reaches 4 degrees and uh, starts to cool below 4 degrees. And as it does, that 4-degree water sinks because the 3-degree water is actually lighter and it floats. And the consequence of this is you reach a point where, in theory at least, you've got uh, isothermal conditions from top to bottom at four degrees. And uh, we call that the overturn because once that density gradient is gone, there's nothing to stratify the system and you get a mixing from top to bottom. That's the fall overturn. Uh, It may never go below this. In fact, it may never get to this point. Let me finish the story. We're in Wisconsin, right? We're in a situation called a dimictic lake. D-I-M-I-C-T-I-C, a dimictic lake is one with two periods of relative stability and two overturns, one in the fall and one in the spring. So what we're doing now is the fall overturn, and it's getting colder and colder. We're going into winter. Uh, Air is getting below the freezing point by a significant amount. There's transfer of heat into the atmosphere out of the water. Um... So the water at the surface keeps getting colder and colder. It doesn't sink because it's lighter than this 4-degree water beneath it or the 3-degree water even beneath it if it's 2 degrees. Eventually, we reach the freezing point at the surface and we get that first nice calm night with a really hard freeze and we get a film of ice. And that film of ice tends to prevent more mixing. And so the ice thickens. And then maybe we get a layer of snow on top of the ice. So in midwinter, in this lake in Wisconsin, we might have zero degrees right beneath the ice and maybe only two or three degrees at the bottom. But sometimes, through strange stuff, you know, there's heat flux coming out of the earth. The earth's relatively warm down deep. You can actually get water above four degrees on the bottom, four or five, six degrees, and... I guess it's mixing all the time, but the mixing is so slow that the flux of heat from the warmer earth beneath is enough to keep that water above. You know, as soon as it gets to five, it it floats, I guess, relative to four. But anyhow, it's not hard to find water that's above four degrees at the bottom. Okay, finally, though, you know, the sun comes back up early in the morning and, and you get more heating. The air warms up, and so the whole thing reverses. 
and you, you get a, a break up of the ice finally in March or early April. Maybe you get a winter kill, depending on how long that winter was and how bad things were underneath the ice. But eventually the water warms up to four degrees and then you get another overturn, the spring overturn. And then the whole process goes into summer and you're going the other way again. So that's an old story and I'm sorry if it's one that you've heard so many times you're sick of it. The word is dimectic for the kind of lake situation I've described. Once you get below about 35 north, uh, you may have a monomictic situation where you know, there's really just one prolonged overturn all winter long. You know, the water at the surface never freezes. And it's pretty much mixed from top to bottom at 4 degrees all winter. And then you go into summer, so that's a monomictic lake. And then uh, you got, we got actually an amictic situation here in Texas, you know, this far south. We don't have, we never have 4 degree water uh, in the bottoms of our reservoirs. Uh, you know, if you went out to Lake Somerville or over to uh, Lake Livingston, uh, you probably wouldn't find water colder than about 10 degrees or 12 degrees, even in winter. And in summer, it would creep on up to 15 or 20, maybe. So that's the story. Yes, Valdemar. How deep should an aquaculture pond be, Valdemar asks, in order to do what? To protect against? Yeah, because if you don't have a radiation, then you don't actually uh, disperse the water. Yeah. Uh, if you have a living, you can have many of the metabolites, like ammonia and sure. nitrides. Yeah, so I, I think Valdemar's point is that if you had deep ponds for aquaculture, you might run the same kind of, you might get into the same kind of uh, meteorological physics that we get into with lakes, and I, I guess you're right. Most ponds, you know, for production aquaculture are in the neighborhood of a meter or two or three at most, but there's an interesting uh, aside there too. It may be that, well, I, I'm not sure this is a point to bring up the aside. If you're going to, if you're going to maintain tunas, uh, you may want to have deeper water because they may actually benefit from the flux and pressures as they go up and down in the water column. Some people are thinking that that might be um, key to bringing them into spawning condition. I'm not sure you can get it deep enough. Maybe you'd be better off with a sea cage, you know, that's real deep. But most uh, production ponds are, are within a meter or two of, well, they're, they're only a couple meters deep at most. So they're pretty much, you know, uh, subject to not having any kind of real stratification most of the time, unless you get a really calm night, and then you can get some serious stratification. And that's part of the reason for having paddle wheel aerators to break that up. Yes? I'm not really aware of the dynamics and temporary ponds for production. Like in the last project, it's something like a during the summer, you get experience uh, turnover during a cloudy day, you're laying and you have a uh, hypothesis condition. Uh, it couldn't happen when the, you're getting rich in the uh, winter or I don't even know the fall, when you're getting the same kind of uh, temperatures in the uh, upper part of your pond or water. And with this reason, if you have a situation also that you could also get like a, we're getting a turn, like cold uh, water turnover where uh, sure. Sure. I think uh, Alejandro asks uh, about in a in a shallow system. You know, uh, you might have, I guess, a multi-mixic situation where you get turnover about any time that uh, you know a turnover at any time would be possible with any kind of stormy or windy weather. And sometimes, if you get a prolonged period of stabilization with an accumulation of the noxic water, maybe some even potential for things like hydrogen sulfide at the bottom, and then you, it is mixed, and that water is brought up into the surface layer. The fish have no no refuge and have to live in... The, all the water becomes a potential uh, problem. I mean, I think probably our colleagues in Texas Parks and Wildlife could tell us about situations where fish have died off um, because of a release of 
materials like <coughs> ammonia from the sediments or even hydrogen sulfide sometimes in stormy weather. But these are, that, that's uh, certainly a, a situation, I guess, that might occur even in a, in a natural system if it were shallow enough, like a shallow bay, because the benthic uh, materials can frequently be pretty, pretty anoxic. I think it could probably could happen most any time, but I think it'd be more serious maybe even in summer. Okay, so um, <clears throat> obvious stuff again, you know, uh, but you need to be sort of encyclopedic here, at least in a superficial kind of way. The range of, of temperatures that that uh, aquatic organisms can see would, would extend down to, I guess, below 1.9 degrees. That's the... Uh, that's the freezing temperature for seawater. So uh, water in the Antarctic might be nearly always around minus 2 degrees centigrade. Uh, 4 degrees at the bottom of the deep lake. Um, 30 degrees at the surface of tropical seas, um, open ocean, but much higher than that in uh, shallow uh, temperate systems like temperate zone salt marshes where the temperatures can regularly hit 40 degrees centigrade. And of course there are some really special uh, habitats like uh, uh, hot springs where the temperatures can be boiling. And um, folks have debated for a long time about the maximum temperatures uh, that fish can survive under these natural conditions. And there are reports in the literature of fish at 50 degrees, you know, things like the Soprenodon group, pupfish. But in my experience, um, what often happens there is you get a very uh, dramatic uh, variation in temperature spatially, uh, heteroformality over a very small span of space. And unless you've actually got uh, the temperature inside the fish, like Ray was talking about with a needle probe, and you read 50 there, then I'm not going to believe the fish was at 50. The water might have been 50 that you measured, but was the fish at 50? It was swimming around nearby. You caught it. But there's lots of wrong values for uh, temperatures experienced by fish in the literature based on uh, circumstantial evidence where the fish are caught and the water is sampled and the two are in the same neighborhood but maybe in different maybe not uh, you know, the fish may not have been breathing that water or exposed to it my guess is uh, I'd be willing to to uh, gamble that uh, the the 96 hour uh, median tolerance limit for temperature for all fish would always be less than 40 degrees centigrade I mean, I might uh, be convinced of, of a difference, but it won't be much different from 40 degrees. I mean, 40 is pretty pretty tough. Most fishes find their maximum tolerable temperatures in the mid to upper 30s, and not not really all the way to 40. Typically, most of the fish that we know here in uh, in the interior of Texas have upper lethals around 35. Diel cycle is an obvious fact of life. Uh, warmest during the afternoon, coolest at night. And the diel cycle of temperature is most prominent in shallow water. And due to a... Uh, I'm hesitant to use the word phenomenon because that implies it's phenomenological instead of mechanistic. But due to the, due to the processes that have to do with... Uh, uh, exponential uh, decay and filtering, the temperature um, often lags behind in the water, that it lags behind the temperature in the air above the water, even on a diel basis. In, uh, in the lab, uh, we will investigate uh, this idea of exponential decay or exponential lag when we deal with um, several things. Well, I guess in the application part of the lab that we're 
that we've just done on feeding, we'll look at the effects of uh, exponential lag in a process. But it's this that accounts for the fact that in Lake Michigan, uh, maximum summer temperatures probably still have not occurred, probably don't occur until late September. And, uh, you know, even though the air above Lake Michigan is headed south now and, and the temperatures have been dropping, you know, maximum air temperature may occur in, in, August, in August, but the, the maximum lake temperature may not occur until a month later. And that's due to, to lags that occur in exponential processes. And it, it's easier to demonstrate that to you by showing it to you in the lab that, we, that we're doing the analysis on than it is to talk more about it now. Um, yes? It's, it's related to, uh, yeah, volume surface relationships and fetch. Bigger, deeper bodies of water have greater lags. They got greater thermal inertia, we call it. Yep. So a little pond, a little shallow pond, a fish pond, wouldn't show much seasonal. That might show some diel lag. You know, you might find that the temperature in the pond uh, doesn't reach its maximum for an hour after the air temperature, and maybe it reaches its minimum, uh, you know, an hour after the air temperature reaches its minimum. So the, the amount of lag is a function of how much thermal inertia there is, and bigger bodies of water have greater thermal inertia. Uh, mentioned warm springs, um, another uh, extreme thermal situation for fishes are cold springs or ambient temperature springs. A rule of thumb for you, if you didn't know it, is that the groundwater temperature from shallow springs tends to be uh, year-round at the mean annual temperature for that latitude. So here in uh, central Texas, uh, San Marcos Springs run year-round at about 20, 21 degrees centigrade. Uh, on the other hand, in uh, Wisconsin, a spring might be uh, 10 degrees. Um, these situations make for really interesting aquatic animal communities because typically um, the, these, war these cool water springs or ambient springs are the warmest habitats that aquatic animals can find uh, in the wintertime. They're 20 degrees when the air temperature may be 10. But in the summer, they're the coolest habitats. And so you get these admixtures of, um, of relatively warm and cold-loving forms. For example, in Great House Springs in uh, northwest Arkansas, uh, you can find, or could years ago when I sampled them, you could find uh, red-bellied dace uh, swimming side by side with gambusia, a thinnest, and... Neither species would occur in that particular habitat without the spring because uh, red-bellied dace need uh, relatively low temperatures in the summer. They're more northerly form. They'd normally be seen in the upper Midwest. And Gambusia thinnis, on the other hand, is a, is a more subtropical form and has a lower lethal right around 4 degrees. So it couldn't survive over winter in the flowing waters that are characteristic of that latitude. Um, thermal pollution used to be uh, a uh, serious uh, concern, more than it has been lately, I guess. And the classic situation is one where you got a discharge of heated effluent from a steam electric power plant, and back in the early days of nuclear power, um, these uh, effluents could be uh, way more than 10 degrees in excess of the ambient. They could be running 20 or 30 degrees warmer. They could be basically cooking everything in the neighborhood that got into that water. Uh, I mean, if you take uh, 20 degree water and you add 30 degrees, I think you've pretty much got a lethal environment for most stuff. Uh, nowadays, um, there's a lot more concern and a lot more um, control so that effluents are typically no more than 10 degrees in open loop uh, steam electric power plants and in situations where it might be more or the threat is that it would be more than the 
the industry has gone to a closed uh, loop uh, recirculation where cooling towers are used. But effective cooling towers are evaporative. And uh, if you evaporate a lot of water, then you're using up a lot of water. And uh, you're also potentially producing a hazard in the form of uh, uh, a lot of fog, for example, in cold weather. And if it's a marine situation, you're also uh, putting a film of salt on everything in the neighborhood, and that's not good either. So there's there's problems on both sides there. There's uh, opposite situations here, too, and that has to do with thermal pollution in the other direction, uh, cold tailwaters from um, hydroelectric uh, installations involve the release of uh, deep hypolimian water that may be 10 or 15 or 20 degrees nearly cooler than the surface water in the neighborhood in the summertime. So you got Bull Shoals, for example, in uh, northwest Arkansas in the Ozarks, and it's releasing water at uh, 12 degrees. And for 100 miles down below Bull Shoals on the White River, you can still detect the Delta T depression or the, the effect of that Delta T on depressing uh, typical stream temperatures. And so you can have a, you know, cold water fishery in the tailwater of Bull Shoals, but maybe you don't have the fishery you once had and you don't have the community of fishes you once had. So there's put and take uh, rainbow trout fishing in the tailwater of Bull Shoals. And where uh, the cold tailwater of Bull Shoals is filling the White River and it is confluent downstream with the Buffalo River, which is a national river, a warm water stream, you go there in July or August, and you've got this very sharp uh, thermal gradient between the cold tailwater that's in the White River and the warm water, the natural temperature of the of the buffalo. And you can see the you know you can see the clear division of the two water masses, and you can also see a school of uh, thread thin shad or something coming to hit that front, and it's like you hit them with a, an electric shocker. You know they're Maybe not killed, but they're certainly uh, shocked by the thermal difference. Maybe a more serious thing, really, in large scale, is the is the change in the temperature of stream flows occasioned by changes in land use in the watershed. And probably the most dramatic example of that is deforestation in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, the uh, you know, the the relationship of heat flux between the air and the sun and the land is affected by the albedo of the surfaces. Uh, and it turns out that bare ground soaks up the heat, so to speak, uh, is irradiated and warmed. And then when it rains and the water runs across that surface and into rivers, um, the heat's carried into the water. And... Um, I think most people accept that there's about a five degree uh, increase in summer temperatures of most of those streams occasioned by the the injection of, of heat caused by this change in land use. And that's, of course, large scale. When you consider that most of the Salmonids have their ultimate upper lethal temperatures in the upper teens or low 20s and the ambient temperature of these streams is already running about 19 or 20, and you add 5 degrees, you, you might not have a good situation. It wouldn't be a good situation. Currents and water movement, um, you know, I guess I just talk in, in cliches and generalities about this. You know, water's moving around. Uh, the forcing things are things like uh, gravitational tides and hydraulic differences, you know, elevations of the land and even uh, density gradients caused by temperature and salinity cause water to move. And moving water carries stuff and erodes the landscape. So, you know, you can get, you, build, you know, you finally get the Grand Canyon, I guess, if you move enough water. Um, even on a small scale, though, the, the characteristics of the habitat, particularly with regard to turbidity and substrate, are dramatically changed by changes in the patterns of water flow. 
Uh, you know, you get a lot of sorting of fine stuff from heavy stuff. Uh, animals, uh, the fish eggs, uh, larvae of fish and forage organisms are moved by the moving water. Some species of fishes like grass carp, for example, depend on uh, transport of the developing larvae in flowing water for normal development. You've got to have a big river with a lot of flow for a long time in order to go through the larval development in the proper way. So that's caused some people to say that grass carp aren't a threat to small uh, streams or bodies because you don't have enough. I mean, there's not a threat of reproducing grass carp. But in the Mississippi drainage, you know, probably in the Mississippi River proper, there's plenty of suspension, uh, plenty of time for suspended larvae in a normal year to develop. I'm not sure what the story is on. I know that in Texas, you know, we we now don't move around grass carp unless they are sterile triploid hybrids because of concerns that there might be reproduction in certain uh, downstream reaches of larger rivers. Um, I think that's finally it for environment. Um, I guess I can justify the time I've taken in talking about environment by saying that everything else depends on that, you know. You've got to have a picture of how the habitat, the characteristics, the features of habitat vary uh, for fish in order to really appreciate the the physiological responses and the behavioral responses to those components of habitat. So um, I guess we won't get to feeding ecology today because it would be kind of pointless to start that uh, at this late time, which is four minutes or five minutes before the end of the class. We've got five minutes for burning questions locally. Uh, anybody got one? Ray, what's your comment about all this? Does it sound consistent with the picture you have in your mind about how fish habitats come together? I've, uh, I've seen some complex habitats in uh, Lake Amistad. Ray says he's seen complex habitats in Lake Amistad, and I bet you have. When, when you have the Pecos River coming in, Pecos, salty, warm. salty, warm Pecos. It plunges down uh, about to uh, 27 feet or so, and we can face that through Lake Amistad, and it puts a cap on the amount of oxygen coming up, I mean, going down uh, from the surface. I don't know. How, this story is getting us to good, though. I think I ought to give you the mic. Let me give it to you. Okay. And be sure and hold it the right way now. Yeah. About down about here and don't hold the bottom. Don't bogart the bottom of the mic. I'm not sure to hold it about, about here. About 30 feet away, right? Well, here. about here. Just, you know, not, not too far. Anyhow, Ray's talking about a very interesting natural thermal plume that's diving. Right. So we have the uh, Pecos River coming into the uh, uh, Lake Amistad or Amistad Reservoir down near Del Rio. And the Pecos is much more salty than uh, Lake Amistad. Um, it combines with the Rio Grande, which is also salty compared with Lake Amistad. They come in and where they meet the lake, they plunge down. We uh, At the plunge point, we call it and we can trace the flow of the Pecos River for many miles into uh, Lake Amistad, you know, like 27 feet, 30 feet down underneath the surface. And that, that stops any diffusion of oxygen down from the surface. So you have the uh, ethylimnion there that has oxygen in it. Then you have the Pecos River salty warm flow. And then you have the, the deep water um, that is... Uh, lacking dissolved oxygen, but then you have all along the bed of the, uh, the, the Fowig, if you will, of the, the Rio Grande, um, you have springs coming up, and the springs have about five milligrams per liter of oxygen. And so the, there are some fish that are trapped, oxygen trapped, on the bottom of the lake um, until there's a, a turnover that allows them to escape. And so when I'm down in some of the springs down there, we see uh, we see oxygen trapped fish there just waiting out the summer. 
it's a pretty cool story, and it reminds me of a similar story that that comes out of the TVA system in uh, in Tennessee and uh, northern Mississippi and Alabama, I guess, um, where you get the same kind of situation with regard to striped bass uh, being seeking thermal refuges from the too high temperatures at the surface and depending on cool springs, but occasionally being uh, being trapped by the fact that there's not enough oxygen in the cool water that they can find. I don't know if they're outright killed or what, but I remember that Chuck Coutant, used to, he was a pretty uh, well-known authority on this topic uh, years ago. He used to talk about hybrid, not striped bass, not hybrid bass, the real pure species and, and thermal refuges and oxygen deficiencies. Okay, well, let's shut it down for today and... Uh, Come back together again on Tuesday and maybe leave environment behind, finally. Uh, more time than I expected to spend on it, but it's good to have some uh, community input, too.